Trevor Ayers from the Queen's University Belfast, who is going to be presenting on observing the recognition complex. Good morning. Um, thanks very much to Kai and Karen, Karen for um, uh, putting together such an interesting uh, group of people uh, to, to meet over the next hour or two. Uh, my name is Trevor Agus, based in Belfast, so I hope you adapt to accents quickly. Um, but a lot of the work that I'm going to show you um, is work that, was, that took place in Paris with uh, Danielle Kresnitzer and Clara Asied. Um, I couldn't find a good picture of Clara, but there's a, um, there's a less pixelated version of her uh, just down there in the second row. Uh, you'll hear from her shortly. Um, and like, like several of us here, uh, we're interested in uh, the recognition of sound. We want to know um, how we just recognise everyday sounds, um, which is an aspect of timbre, um, but I would argue quite an important aspect of timbre for, for getting about in, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, just, uh, so, so two aspects of that uh, is, is what features can we use to recognise uh, a sound, um, but also um, you know, what features do we use in practice, uh, so when we have a whole range of, of different cues in a natural sound, uh, which of them do we, do we prefer to use? And just to sort of illustrate uh, the distinction there, um, if we go to uh, speech intelligibility, uh, we know that we can understand speech uh, even in very distorted versions. So if we have noise vocoded speech, we get rid of many of the, say, voicing cues that we might normally use when understanding speech, but we can still attain uh, nearly uh, you know, 90, 95% um, recognition of the words. So we can survive without many of the cues, we can fall back on secondary cues. Um, and at the other, the other side of that coin is that there may be some cues that, um, that we're very aware of, where we're very, we're, we're, um, taking a visual example, um, we're able to have discussions about colour. We can talk about very subtle distinctions in colour. Um, but when it comes to recognising an object, we can do very well in black and white. Um, so this is a speeded recognition task uh, to long it out. Um, and humans and monkeys uh, are very good at processing these complex scenes and in about 100 milliseconds um, they have identified um, whether, whether or not the picture contains an animal uh, or not. Um, so, uh, and, and whether it's in black and white uh, it made virtually no difference. Um, so although we're very aware of colour, colour doesn't seem to be something that we're using to recognise objects um, visually. So we wanted to do a, an auditory equivalent of this. Um, and um, a, a problem that we hit sort of in psychophysics, we often ask people to do a task and we judge um, whether they get it right or get it wrong. Um, but for most familiar sounds, the ones that are really interesting, um, like human voice, um, we're pretty good at recognising whether or not it's a human voice, uh, which makes the, you know, comparisons between conditions quite difficult. So we took a leaf out of the Visual Scientist's book and measured reaction times uh, instead. So in part one, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll describe that. And um, the idea being that if the response, if we if we distort, um, say, the human voice, um, and the reaction times slow down, then uh, that would imply that we have messed up some of the critical cues that were being used to recognise the voice. Uh, in part two of today's rather short talk, um, uh, um, we'll take more, more drastic action and use a situation where listeners have learnt to recognise a sound for the first time. Uh, and because we can control what sound they're learning, uh, we can make sure that they learn a sound that we can work with easily and we can manipulate and control more easily than many of the natural sounds from our everyday environment. So, uh, reaction times. Um, this is the bit of equipment we used. Uh, listeners would press a button to sort of uh, say that they're ready for the trial. And then uh, if they wanted to make a, a response to that particular sound, depending on the task, um, they could release the button as fast as possible. We do it that way around because it's easier to, it's faster to release a button than to, to hit a button. Um, so that's, that's the reason we do it that way around. And, uh, 
In one condition, the task that we gave our listeners was to recognise um, a human voice, so it was just a, a sung vowel sound. Um, I'll play an example of that. Uh, so it's very quiet. Um, well, maybe in the meantime, uh, I can demonstrate it. It sounds like ah, um, very like that. So when when listeners um, had to do that, um, they were um, uh, so, so we asked listeners to respond to the to the human voice uh, and ignore the other sounds that were there. So, for example, if you heard um, a, a saxophone, um, then uh, then you should not respond at all. Um, no worries. Um, so, but you get the idea. There's um, there's a human voice, uh, and whenever you hear it, lots of different pitches. Um, you should respond, and if you hear a, a musical instrument, um, then uh, you should not respond. So it's a go no go task we call it. Uh, that was one condition. In another condition, um, in another condition, we asked people to, to respond to um, st any string instruments that they heard. So there were violins and cellos inserted in there. And uh, your task is to respond every time you hear uh, um, a, a violin or a cello and ignore all the other sounds. Um, so, um, Lisha has performed both these tasks. Uh, it feels a lot easier to, to respond to the voice. Um, but it still takes, it takes about 450 milliseconds on average to, to um, recognise that it's a human voice and, and respond to it. So that's a good half second essentially. Um, but it's, uh, for the string instruments, it was uh, about 100 milliseconds slower, uh, which doesn't sound like much, but in reaction times, uh, in, re in the reaction time literature, people get excited quite easily about sort of 10 milliseconds. Uh, so this is kind of, kind of quite a huge difference by, um, uh, in reaction time terms. And in case there was something about the string instruments uh, that made them particularly annoying, um, we, we tried sort of uh, push it to the max with uh, percussion. We thought the percussion, or you have a very clear onset, it should be obvious from the start which is which. Um, and they were still uh, a bit slower, so they're about 50 milliseconds slower than the human voice. Um, so we had um, uh, a, a benefit for the human voice, and people were also being more accurate for the human voice. So it wasn't just that they were particularly enthusiastic in the voice condition. Um, they, even though they were earlier, they were also more accurate, so they're genuinely finding it an easier task to respond to the human voice. Um, so, there are many reasons for this. Obviously, we are, we're all experts in the human voice. Whether, you know, no matter how musical we are, uh, we still have more experience with, with the human voice. Um, and there is a sort of categorical difference there between we've got voices contrasted with orchestral instruments. Um, so, you know, that could contribute to the speed of response. Um, it could be, you can make up a just so story here, it could be that we have evolved through being selectively eaten by lions if we didn't respond fast enough to the human voice. Uh, you, know, there's, you can think of a myriad of reasons um, why, why we should be faster for the human voice. Uh, but for our purposes, we were interested in how, how are we recognising the human voice. So we're excited here because we have a difference, uh, whatever the reason for it is. Um, so we can try and take, you know, make use of this by, um, by taking an altered version of the voice. And specifically, I guess because we could, uh, we looked at um, whether, pe whether this faster response came from the, um, essentially the spectrum of the voice. So the spectrum of the voice is responsible for conveying that, uh, that vowel sound information all the form and structure. Um, so, so did the speed response come from that? or um, uh, did it come from the um, changes over time, um, uh, which, which I'm going to refer to as the modulation. So all of the temporal structure, all of the sort of any pitch um, fluctuations, that, that kind of thing. And um, so we created some auditory chimeras um, by, by combining the spectrum and modulations of the voice and the string instruments. And um, this is going to be more challenging to impersonate. Um, 
you know. Um, but um, if, if, you, if you, you can essentially apply the spectrum of the human voice to string instruments, uh, and it's, it still sounds quite stringy, there's still that kind of chug at the start, um, but you can start to hear the A ah and the E, it's kind of like the violins and cellos are, are talking to you. And the other um, extreme of that is, uh, or the other version of that is that you take the human voice and give it the spectrum of, of the string instruments. So that is easier to impersonate, it sounds a bit like and um, so we, we lose all of the vowel information and it sounds like a gagged person essentially, but it's still quite voicey uh, in, in that sense. Um, so uh, again we measured the natural uh, uh, human voice with both the spectrum and the modulations intact and again we got sort of about four, a bit, I've been about 400, about 400 and, uh, uh, about 430 milliseconds uh, it was this time. So the question was what about our two vocal chimeras? Is it going to be the spectrum or the modulations that gets our, our faster response. Um, so when we change the spectrum uh, to have a string spectrum, uh, keeping the, the, voice, the voice modulations, uh, our, uh, the response time in the listener was greatly slowed down um, in the region of a sort of magnitude of, of 100 milliseconds again. Uh, so it all falls upon the other chimera, and it was pretty much as slow. So it didn't matter which of the two chimeras we used, uh, this really slowed down um, our, our listeners, uh, which is a, um, in fact, we, th th even if we used entirely non-vocal auditory chimeras, so if we cross our string and percussion instruments, um, uh, these were um, essentially as slow as the, um, as, as the, um, uh, there was no difference between the chimeras. Yes? Sorry, maybe I missed this. So they were responding that the chimeras were voice in both those cases? Um, no, so in this task, uh, sorry, I didn't say, in this task, uh, we didn't give them sort of verbal instructions. We said, can you respond to these sounds? Uh, and they could sort of listen to as many of them as, as they liked to make sure they knew which sounds they're listening for and which sounds they're ignoring. Okay. And we had various chimeras or um, uh, uh, um, orchestral instruments in, in different conditions, and it, it didn't affect the, the results, uh, what the distractors um, uh, were. I see, yes, so we avoided, uh, we, we sidestepped that issue by just playing audio examples. Um, so um, what, what this means is that whenever we're quickly recognizing a human voice, it seems that we're not just relying on the spectral cues, or we're not just relying on the modulation cues uh, in isolation, but we're combining both very quickly uh, to recognize the intact uh, human voice, uh, which is maybe not the result we were hoping for, but it does sort of tell us um, that, that a lot of the simple ways we may try and sort of break apart the human voice uh, to isolate the cues of interest um, are, are going to be, well, th these methods are going to be challenging because we're actually using either multiple cues at the same time or um, more complex spectrotemporal cues um, combined. Um, Good news for the neuroscientists um, is that these responses are mirrored in uh, what Pascal Ballin refers to as the temporal voice areas, areas uh, which I think um, overlap with uh, Katerina's uh, timbre region from, from part one, uh, if I could get the geography of the, of the, fMRI, uh, of the MRI correct. Um, so uh, we, we do see more responses in the temporal voice areas for the natural voices uh, and the chimeras uh, both reduce the amount of power there. Uh, okay, so that's the um, reaction times so far, so I'm going to jump over to um, situations where listeners are learning to recognise um, a new sound. Um, and the inspiration for this was some of our computational um, neuroscientist colleagues um, who noted that even a single neuron uh, is uh, set up in such a way that it will learn fairly arbitrary sequences. Um, so, um, Given that we have a brain full of these neurons, you would expect us to be, you know, uh, you would expect us to adapt to learning new features quite easily. And um, this seemed like a very strange suggestion, so we, we put it to the test uh, and asked, "Can we learn novel features?" Um, and we used white noise, uh, which um, is sounds essentially like shh. Um, and uh, the advantages of using this particular sound are, are, are manifold. Um, but um, it's, it's a complex sound, and uh, I guess too often we're, we 
your tones, it's nice to start with something that is as complex or more complex than, than everyday sounds. Uh, it's, uh, it's meaningless in a sense, uh, you know, people don't have uh, you know, uh, uh, prior associations with individual snippets of noise. Um, and there are so many random numbers that go into white noise that the chances are you would never have heard a specific snippet of white noise before. So we've got sort of a guaranteed novelty. Uh, and that also means that I have an everlasting supply of controlled sounds that you have not yet learnt. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to set up the experiments in, under these conditions. Um, so the, uh, the task we used, uh, we didn't directly ask listeners, do you recognise this, this noise? At least we didn't at first. Um, I, I did try that at some point, and with naive listeners, they give you very strange looks and very strange responses. Um, so we, we used a, an alternative task um, in which we could implicitly uh, observe whether, whether or not they could recognise the noise. So the task we actually gave them, thank you, um, was um, to, um, uh, we, we played them a second of noise and uh, um, asked them um, to detect repetitions in it. So half of the noises um, had at the second half um, identical to the first half. So we asked listeners um, to, to detect this, you know, is the noise repeated or not? And it is a very difficult task. Um, uh, if I played you an example, you would probably think it just sounded like any other noise. Um, but we gave the listeners a potential crutch, which was that we included some reference repeated noises. So a reference repeated noise is just like any other repeated noise when you first hear it. So it's got the second half the same as the first. But um, later on, within the same block, next time you come across a reference repeated noise trial, um, it's exactly the same noise as you heard just a few trials back, for example. And you hear this, uh, initially it was 50 times wi within a block. Uh, as opposed to the ordinary noises and, and repeated noises, which were generated afresh each time, so you'd never heard any of them before. So um, we predicted that, um, or we, we, our interpretation was that um, if people got better at detecting repetitions in the reference repeated noise, then that suggests they have developed some kind of a memory for noise. Uh, they've learned something in it. Um, and that's exactly what um, uh, we did see. Um, so the, um, that they were better at detecting repetitions in, in the various reference repeated noises than the ordinary RNs. Um, showing that they have, they're learning white noise. Um, and uh, this surprised us uh, was how fast they learned it. So within about the first five presentations of the noise, they're doing most of the learning that they're ever going to do um, in it. And uh, it may sound like a difficult task, but um, I wasn't involved in this, um, but Thomas Andréon, as part of his PhD thesis, um, has shown that listeners can actually do this task in their sleep, um, depending on the state of the sleep. Uh, so as far as I know, that's just in his thesis, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing that um, come out. Um, so we're interested in what cues listeners are, are, use, are, are, are picking out of this white noise. Um, and I should probably say up front, I haven't got the answer for you yet today, but we've made big steps towards getting that answer. Um, and the way we can investigate this is to substitute in uh, transformed versions of the RefRN. Same idea uh, as the voice, um, if they continue to recognise it, then we've preserved the cues. Uh, for example, if we turn the noise back to front, we get another white noise um, and uh, listeners continue to recognise or to be able to detect repetitions uh, in, that, in that noise. So this suggests that they're relying on perhaps relatively narrow slices in time and um, such that when you reverse them there's essentially no particular change. Um, we um, time compress the noises by resampling them which also has an effect of uh, frequency shifting uh, at the same time. And um, we find that the learning transferred up to about uh, a quarter uh, of, of an octave, uh, just to put it in more intuitive terms. Uh, but if we um, shifted it up by about half an octave, then listeners have to essentially learn it from scratch um, again. So there is some transfer across frequency, but it doesn't go very far. 
Um, and uh, the most extreme one is that we uh, used noises with different spectra, and we had um, uh, listeners learn, uh, learn the reference speed of noise with one particular random spectrum, and did a smooth transformation um, to a different spectrum, which preserves a lot of the temporal structural cues uh, in the white noise. Uh, and we find that a, a lot of that learning um, transferred uh, across to the new spectral shape. So it seems that they're using um, some kind of temporal modulation uh, information in the noise, uh, which I guess there isn't much else in there. Um, one worry was that this is not at all recognition. It's something very specific to repetition detection. Um, so we slipped in, uh, in a different experiment, some um, what we call mixed stimuli, which were half like the reference repeated noise, but the other half was repeated, was, um, uh, the other half was replaced by uh, a brand new noise. Um, so these are not repeated, but they are recognisable. Um, and we caught our listeners cheating, essentially. They were tricked into saying that these mixed stimuli um, were repeated. Um, okay, so they said they were repeated even more than the, than the um, brand new uh, repeated noises. So the mixed stimuli, um, yeah, so they seem to be um, recognizing the noise and um, uh, using that uh, as a substitute uh, for, for spotting the repeated noises. So normally when listeners are disobeying instructions, it's a bad thing, but here uh, it's a good thing. They are um, uh, generally using uh, recognition um, rather than something specific to repetition detection. Um, uh, you might be wondering what on earth they're hearing in noise. Um, we got some expert music listeners, uh, ones with exceedingly good transcription skills, and gave them a keyboard, allowed them to listen to the noise as much as they liked, and they transcribed for us uh, what they were hearing. So here are a few different examples of the same noise, different listeners. Um, and um, it, they all look very different, um, but if we sneaked back the same noise to the same listeners, often days later, um, they gave um, uh, quite um, similar transcriptions. So, um, for example, this listener has, um, uh, this is just an octave transposition, uh, effectively. So they are uh, repeatedly getting similar features um, within the listener. And uh, just to reassure you, when, it, when they're presented with a different noise, uh, they, they transcribe different features. Uh, it didn't always work out this well, but overall, it seems that different listeners are hearing different things, uh, even in the same noise, uh, is the summary of that. So that's a mixed experience, a bit challenging. Um, so, uh, so in summary, um, it seems that with our everyday sounds, um, like human voice, people are combining both spectral and temporal information. Uh, with the noise learning strand, uh, the features we're observing seem to be um, fairly local in time, and uh, I didn't show this today, uh, also local in, in frequency. Um, but different listeners learn different features, which um, combining that information means that we should be able to zoom in on the spectrotemporal region uh, and hopefully find out what on earth they're picking out of, of these white noises. Thank you very much. Yes, um, so, so the reference repeated noises were um, always the same within a single block, um, but for um, uh, each listener would complete, uh, well, initially it was six such blocks, so they would have the chance to learn six different reference repeated noises. Yes, uh, so uh, in a, in a follow-up experiment, we, we took some of the noises that had been learnt and some that weren't, because there were, there were disparities. Uh, but we weren't sure whether, because they all heard different reference repeat noises, we, we weren't sure. Um, and when we presented um, the same noises to different listeners, excuse me, um, we, we didn't find that, we, we were expecting to see good noises and bad noises, uh, but we didn't find a significant difference between them. And saying that, there was a follow-up experiment with many, many 
dyslexic and non-dyslexic control listeners um, in collaboration with Frank Gramu. And um, we did observe that some noises were learnt very well over a much larger, with, with a lot, much, lot, much larger number of people. Um, but to minimise variability in that particular study, the order uh, of presentation was also fixed. So we have a, it wasn't designed to test that, so it suggests that some noises are better than others. Um, but um, we haven't got that smoking gun yet. Um, I, 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 so it was the um, random number generator in, in that lab, so it was normal, it was uh, using random, uh, so generating... Yes, um, at the moment I'm just having faith in that lab, but uh, if there are ways to check that, I'd be interested to discuss it with you. Yes. At the same time, you alluded that something about the temporal information is useful, so trying to reconcile these two. Um, I, I suppose by that I like, to, if, if for example, uh, because there are lots of short term fluctuations within noise, like if you look in a particular auditory filter, there's, it, it's not that it's bland, it's almost that there's too much going on. Um, and uh, so if it was something as simple as a, as a, as a short term peak, in noise, and I don't think it is because we've gone looking for, for that. Uh, if it was something as simple as that, then if you turn it back front, you would still have a peak, mm -hmm. for example. All right. Well, are there any more questions? Oh, so, sorry, in the reverse situation, were they aware that the sound was with there? Um, no, we, we did it mid block, so they were just um, uh, doing the repetition detection task, and uh, halfway through the block, and the reference repeated noise would be turned back to front. Maybe for them it's just two different noise. But they learn... Uh, well, they didn't seem to have a dip. Uh, so if they had to learn it from scratch, we would expect um, their, re their reference detection to go back to baseline and then back up. Uh, and we just saw a, a straight line across. And do you have musicians that were able to transcribe it, to transcribe also the reverse one? Um, we didn't ask them. Uh, from my own informal listening, I, I'm pretty sure I could tell you um, I could distinguish the direction it was going because uh, you can see from the transcriptions they, they were picking out several noises uh, at different times so they can give you the rhythms of them. Um, so I'm pretty sure if you listen to it backwards you'll get um, the, the, the notes and the clicks um, in, in reverse. Um, uh, but we haven't got that uh, from the experiment. Because, I mean, I've been listening a lot to first notes and some, often the, the features are happen, happening at the end. It's kind of this, this you start this really, really round up and you have this little shut mm -hmm. in, in the end. So I was, well, I was wondering if you reverse it, do you hear the shut at the beginning? Yeah, and um, people do tend to learn features in, in the middle as well. I, I, that, that is certainly one of the strategies, is that there's sometimes interesting stuff at the, at the end, but uh, I think there is interesting stuff in the middle uh, as well.